when you like what you're doing, I think um, it makes a difference. And uh, I think most people that like what they're doing are probably better at what they do because they like it. You know, and uh, being around people that like what they're doing, uh, it's just a good environment, a good thing to. Uh, it just, I think it builds success a lot of times. Uh, not just economic success, but, um, you know, things work better that way. I started fishing in 1973. Uh, I was going to college back east, and um, somehow we'd heard about fishing in Alaska. And uh, I had a good pal who, uh, we were really good friends, and we decided that uh, we wanted to go to Alaska. It was always a dream to go to Alaska, and then I remember just started talking to the trollers and talking to people and uh, starting to learn and of course the lure of all the boats and the water there was really uh, really profound for a young boy and uh, um, it just was really neat. I uh, started fishing when uh, while working on the boat as a tender uh, when I was about eight years old and then we switched over to seining when statehood took away the fish trap. So 59 was the first year of seining, and been doing it ever since. Well, we all jumped in a truck one day and decided where we were gonna, actually I had a friend uh, fishing down in southern Texas there and uh, went down to uh, see him and when we got down there, I we drew straws because he had room for one more crewman on board and I won or lost. And Anyway, I went out for 15 days. I got seasick for three days and the first three days and then after that I thought well this is pretty cool being out on the ocean catching fish and shrimp and and I kind of fell in love with the water right then and there. I got into the fishing business uh, I came up here one day and uh, started walking the docks and and talking to some skippers and eventually landed a job as a cook first off and, and uh, started fishing I finally met a guy, had a little boat, and was just getting started, and put me on, and brought me up here. I spent the summer seining with him, and I just thought it was awesome, loading the boat with salmon, and the way the salmon come in, and and uh, all the boats are loading up, and it's pretty exciting, you know, with the, the competition between the boats, you know, even a couple of minutes, you know, make a difference, you know, in hauling the gear, you know, to beat another guy hauling gear, and then run back to the set, and get the set out and I was just cool. I just loved every part of it. It was beyond my wildest dreams. I actually couldn't believe that, uh, well first that we actually, that it was actually happening and that it was, uh, I really like seining and I love net fishing. And, uh, and for me, I just thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen or, or done, you know, and that uh, uh, just, you know, the environment in Alaska is just absolutely beautiful, just gorgeous, and uh, all the nooks and crannies and coves and mountains and beautiful weather and long daylight and uh, um, being out on a boat on the water. Everybody has a different role on the boat, and everybody does their, takes care of their position takes care of the we have the deck boss the engineer uh, we've got a skiff driver and a skipper and a cook so everybody performs their role so on these boats a lot of what happens is uh, is you just kind of get thrown into it as far as learning what's going on you you end up making your first set basically and and figuring it out from that point on so it's not you don't for the purse setting, you don't go through a whole lot of training or anything. You just kind of like jump into it and they, and you figure it out as the gear comes spilling out of the block at you. Pretty much everybody has a job, a specific job, uh, that they're pretty much expected to do and, and to stay with. And, uh, and that's what works best for the most part. And uh, um, so you set the gear and... Uh, you basically follow the routine, you get used to how it works. You, after you see it a few times, you know, you get a lot more comfortable with it. I mean, you're not gonna come on board and, and be an engineer right off the bat, you know, if you don't know anything about, you know, maintaining or maintenance or uh, engines or mechanical stuff like that. But you start as maybe a pollen web, and then you move on to pollen gear, and then you start getting more familiar with uh, maybe, uh, you know, rigging and lines and the net 
is real important to understand how the net's put together and how it works and the differences between parts of the net. Then you might jump in the skiff and become a skiff man. Yeah, okay, you speed up a little, keep towing a little bit. Basically, it's important to have everybody pretty much know what their job is. And then on here, you know, after time to break the routine up, when people are familiar with it, they can switch jobs. You know, we switch jobs around. It breaks up the routine. And, and it's kind of common that a greenhorn would be a web poller, mostly to pile the web. And then he would probably move up to leads or corks or something like that. Of course, you know, you do your best to maintain your gear so that lines aren't going to break or that type of thing. And, and hardware, you know, there's a lot of hardware involved in the links between the lines and the net. And um, that hardware has to be in good shape. And uh, it's important, you know, how those things are connected. And you minimize your risks in those ways. You know, one of the things about commercial fishing is that, you know, we're all driven. Everybody's driven, too. I mean, we like what we do, of course, but the, that aspect of being driven is really important. It is very competitive. And, uh, um, you know, I think sometimes you think, especially when, when you're younger, you think that, you know, the key to success is working harder, uh, pushing faster, you know, and. Uh, and there is some merit to that, but it also makes you take more chances that, you know, um, that make it a little more, little more risky. And it's hard to slow down when, uh, when you're young, you know. It's hard to slow down because uh, you like it so much and you want to do well. And, and, you know, the more effort you put into it, you think will pay off. When I jumped in, permits were at a premium. and. Uh... Uh, of course, uh, boats and everything were at a premium. The fishery was strong, and uh, uh, so I, uh, I wanted to do good. I, I jumped in, and, and uh, I, I wanted to be a highliner. I wanted to just, you know, be right on top there and come home with the bacon, you know. And uh, uh, we tried probably harder than, than what you would. I mean, at least, uh, you know, trying to do the best we can, and uh, probably got a little overzealous. And you do the best you can to be vigilant as far as uh, with safety practices. And, but the nature of this business is that things do happen. And uh, accidents do happen. And people get hurt and gear gets destroyed. Boats sink. Boats roll over. And, uh, and oftentimes it isn't always neglect. You know, it's just a situation that comes up that creates another situation that leads to another situation. And um, those are the things that get people a lot. And, you know, you, you can't always uh, uh, prevent every, every little incident, but, you know, we have to do our best to, to try and be ready for that type of thing. And, uh, um, again, being aware is a really big issue. For our crew now, counting myself as five, a lot of the guys get by with uh, three, uh, I still, I still like to have the five-man crew for safety because the fewer men you have, the hours are just as long, and uh, it doesn't go around <laughs> quite as well. Well, everything could go wrong on a boat. Man overboard is a big, big concern, and uh, I want everybody to know because I might be the one in the water. I, want, I first I instruct them on how I, you know, to turn the boat around because it's, you know. 35 tons of uh, motion going through the water and uh, the big thing is to uh, keep an eye on that individual in the water. Have someone, you know, uh, looking at them the whole time because a, a head in the water gets real small, real fast and, and I've heard stories about guys going over with the net. Uh, of course, uh, horseplay, you know, after you do this stuff for a month at a time, it's repetition, and, and, and the repetition gets you good at, at doing what you're doing, you know, what to do and how to do it and what things should look like, and if something gets out of place. Well, I've heard of guys in horseplay start jumping line like it's a jump rope and, and, and getting caught up, uh, and uh, they just get bored, you know, and, and it just gets repetition, you know, every day, you know, just the same thing kind of going on, and you make, you know, 13, you know, 15 sets a day, and... and uh, they want to make something, you know, out of it. They they want that adrenaline pump, and they want something to something to go wrong. I mean, it, 
and uh, I've seen that before where guys get antsy and, and they want to make something happen that you know might be kind of exciting and uh, and that that can be dangerous uh, I, you know I see that happen I, I get down on a crewman real hard you know for doing horseplay uh, of course they get into the tired I mean especially after we've been working hard and you'll unload and you get you know two three four hours sleep and you're back at it again and guys walking around like a zombie and and uh, and not doing his job, not picking up on what, you know, slacking back on, you know, on, on coiling the line nice or whatever needs to be done there. And and sometimes, it, you know, he just gets down to, you know, uh, laying the law down to him and, and, you know, saying, you know, this is it and we got to, you know, we got to keep it together here and and uh, let's, not, uh, let's not be f***ing up, you know, and hurting somebody. <laughs> You know, a lot of what fishing, commercial fishing is, is, is preparing to go and cleaning up afterwards. And a lot of the actual work sometimes doesn't really last that long, you know. Um, like I say, uh, um, in some of our fisheries, like, we spend more time getting ready and cleaning up than we actually do a fishing. And then when you get to the actual fishing part, um, that's a different situation. There, you need to be, you need to have somebody who's aware and as a, a greenhorn you need to be aware um, and that's a problem sometimes because you know you're overwhelmed with what you're doing it's new to you and um, you know you're concentrating everything you can on your job specifically like say for instance piling web uh, and it's tough and so it's hard for you to be aware of what else is going on around you and that's very important in commercial fishing you have to get to the point where you know, you, you're constantly watching out, being paying attention to what else is going on. And basically in a sanding operation, what happens is, you know, you have your net on the stern and um, you have it piled with leads and corks opposite um, or in a manner so that it will go off without tangling. And you have your skiff in the back. Um, so the skiff, you release the skiff and um, let, we say let her go and then the skiff takes off and we're making a set, it's called. And uh, some, most sets in salmon are, are open sets. They're not necessarily round hauls where you just set and you come right around. Most of the time we make an open set, so there's some time after the gear goes off. While the gear's going off, it's very important, of course, that everything goes off even and smoothly. And naturally, of course, you know, you don't want to be standing on, the, on moving gear that's going off over the stern so you know you stay out of the way and you don't want to be in it in a way of any lines that would possibly be tangling and it's important to keep the lines clean and off the deck when it's time you bring the skiff back in and it's called what's closing up he comes alongside he passes off his lines and we get ready to haul the net in and uh, one line comes from the skiff and goes across through the purse block then it goes on to the wench that's on all the time more or less when we're hauling gear and um, and then the skiff goes around, gets through, and goes out on the side of the boat and then attaches to a bridle and holds the boat steady. So he's in position to just keep the boat uh, into the wind or tide. And then the net comes through the power block and starts coming down on deck. And the crew's job on the back, part of the crew's job, is to separate the leads and the corks and pile the gear in a manner so that um, the end of the net will be on the bottom and the top of the net will be or what we call the bunt will be on top and uh, and then when we set again hook up and it goes off evenly again and really for the most part in saning a lot of what we do is setting over and over and over again every day uh, so uh, it has to go smoothly and and, and the routine of it uh, uh, because you do it a lot um, is important and the first part of the operation is slower than the second part of the operation after the after um, we purse the bottom of the net so that the fish wouldn't be able to get out, um, once those rings come up, as, as the way we call it, um, then um, you just haul the gear back on deck and it's just a matter of getting the gear back on, on the deck so you go faster then, the power block goes faster. When the net's out, one of our jobs, usually what's routinely is, you're usually uh, um, 
cleaning the deck, um, hosing down. Um, if you have some fish on deck that you're cleaning or dressing or some fish maybe to put back in the hold uh, to push into the refrigerated hold. Um, you're doing that kind of work in between. It's usually about 20 minutes. Uh, you have your gear out. We call it making a set. Well, the tow line, you have to watch out that, you know, uh, that's a vulnerable area. If you're back on the deck and not paying attention and tow line can come across and that's, that's been a common injury for some people where they've been knocked down by the tow line. And uh, most of the time it's not something that knocks them overboard, but knocks them down on deck and, you know, they could hit their head on the railing or something like that. And we have had a, uh, we have had a real bad injury to a skipper that happened to uh, a few years back. The worst accident we've had is, has not been, it's been myself actually. And uh, uh, basically I got hit by the David right here behind me. Uh, purse block popped out, um, swung around while we were purse and popped up out of its socket as I was standing next to it, it hit me in the head and uh, I'm by my temple and uh, uh, cracked my skull and severed my artery and uh, I lost a lot of blood and, and they flew me out and uh, you know it's one of those situations where uh, I was lucky because there happened to be an EMT on board on one of my friend's boats and she came over and uh, I called her and uh, uh, and there was a plane nearby and they flew me in and so I was very fortunate in that. A lot of kids get hurt and being you've you've seen a sane operation, when the skiff comes alongside, lots of times they get their fingers smashed by hanging over the side, or they'll go to step up and get a leg in between. So that's one of the big things. Uh, setting the sane, uh, there's been guys that have been drug overboard, or uh, they've been tangled up in the purse line, had broken legs. Uh, there's there's a lot of things can happen. Falling in the hatch. Uh, there was a kid here a few years ago that was tangled up in the, in the, on the winch. And it threw him down in a hatch, broke his neck, and killed him. That was about 10, 12 years ago. So it's uh, it it is a dangerous job. It can be. There, you know, as the summer goes on in Alaska, like it seems like the, the jellyfish increase. Some years are bad jellyfish years. Other years are are not. You can't help when you're piling gear. You know, the power blocks above your head, and you know, water. You get wet and that's why you wear rain gear for the most part. It's not always raining and windy in Alaska like you know you might think, although a lot of times it can be, but um, uh, the jellyfish come down out of the power block and they spray it and it's like the red ones, they, they have long tentacles, you know, some of those tentacles are 15 feet long and it's just, it's really just the mist that comes off and sometimes they're just really hot. Some, some of them aren't, you can't necessarily tell by looking at them in the water and say, oh, that's a really hot one, but just some spots are just really hot and you can't avoid them really, but what you do want to avoid is getting them in your eye. Well, I, uh, when uh, we're working and setting the net, you know, there's, there's obviously a lot of things that can go wrong. Uh, lines getting tangled, uh, crewmen trying to save the day, you know, by uh, jumping in there and trying to untangle a line when, you know, You've got uh, 350 horsepower pulling against a quarter mile net and, you know, 35 tons of boat in motion, you know. And so when you're setting that, that's a really important time uh, to pay attention to and can be a very dangerous time if you were in the wrong spot. You get a little careless sometimes or you get too, too rushed. I think probably most of the injuries that I've seen, most of the things that have happened have been from being in a hurry. The pressure to produce, to get your net in, to compete to get the next set, you know, um, um, that's a lot of what causes it. And it's hard to slow down and realize that you can still be as productive and, um, and maybe as successful. I find that I think my biggest thing is uh, complacency and that's what, that's what gets a lot of people is you start, you start getting a little bit lazy and then you have thousands of pounds of pressure on all these lines that are going across the deck and, and uh, going to the deck winch, going, coming out of the power block. And uh, uh, if you start getting lazy about it, you start not paying attention to what's going on and something happens and you get caught and stuck in a line and there's really nothing you can do about it. You know, there's, there's so much pressure on these hydraulic winches and stuff that you can't you can't, there's no way you can overcome anything like that, you know. I was pursing up the end of the net and the line, the line coming around the deck winch got backlash 
And instead of shutting off the deck winch by the control and backing it up and uh, fixing the problem, I decided to reach in there and try and see if I could snap it free. And so I reached in with my right hand and tried to snap it free. And my, my glove got caught in the line there and started going around. At this point, I should have reached across and tried to reach the, the deck control. Um, it, was, it was kind of a far reach, and so my immediate reaction was to reach in with my left hand and try and free my right hand. Uh, and then my left hand got caught, and both my arms started going, wrapping around the deck winch. And um, they popped out as I came up over the top, it popped out. And uh, my, of the gloves, my hands popped out of the gloves, and the gloves kept going around. <clears throat> Finally, shut it off. The gloves kept going around and cut the fingers off the gloves, and uh, and finally we untangled it. I, I came away with basically my my fingers were all sprained, um, and I tore up the back of my hand and got, and got rope burns, uh, all of both arms. So came away very lucky from that. The wench is probably insane. Probably most people are the worst accidents uh, other than sinking or drownings and people have gone down. But as far as working accidents have come from the wench, the sane wench, and uh, people getting wrapped up in the wench. And uh, everyone's aware of it that's been fishing for a while and, and has heard of the stories. Uh, uh, an old friend of ours, Gunnar Nielsen, um, was, I'll never forget, that's the first one that I was aware of. I'll never forget when it happened. On August 15th of that day, it was rough out in the ocean. We decided to move into a place called Boca de Finas to fish, where it was a little bit of uh, sheltered water. Uh, there was four, four other boats there, and uh, two from Petersburg and two Godzinski uh, family boats. So there's plenty of room for five boats to work there, so I was working with them. Um, I waited for a tide. You can fish either, you can turn your net around and fish either way there. And so I got in line to get a tide set. And uh, I was trying to time my set properly. And uh, we made the set, and when we closed up and brought the skiff alongside, um, one felt, we hooked, it was right at the beginning of the set, we hooked up the, the ends of the net, and my one deck man dropped the line going to the skiff in the water, so we lost control of the skiff. He was, he was messing around with trying to fix that, and I was tending, on the, tending the purse line. I got in my corner of my eye, I saw a jump salmon jump in the corner of my net. So I wanted to keep the purse rolling even though the guys were messing around with this other little problem. So I reached over like this to put another wrap on. My, my, my rain gear went right underneath this line and got caught in the line. I then reached back here to this lever, I reached actually back like this, grabbed, this boat was a little smaller than this one so I had room, grabbed this lever right here and it slipped out of my hands. It then just pulled me right through the, right through the winch and I proceeded to go over the winch and went around in between this passage and here three times. Uh, I went right over this button, basically. Uh, I knew, I saw my rain gear go into the, into, the, into the line, and I reached down to pull it up, I reached for the handle, and that's all the time I had. It happened so fast. Um, I'd been, I'd, this is not the first set of the day. It was not the first set I'd made. It's not the first time the first line slipped. Uh, it's the first time I got caught. That's the only thing that happened. You know, the calls on the radio and uh... Again, there was an EMT came on board and probably helped save Gunner's life, but it was very harrowing to listen to on the radio. I remember the whole fleet just basically stopped dead and just listened to the, to the accident um, happening and developing and, and just keeping our fingers crossed. But yeah, and Gunner is not the only one that that's happened to. Uh, Randy Debrinia, catch a can, uh, fell on the Cape Falcon. I leased an old boat and uh, it was uh, a little bit defective in, in the, uh, it was a little bit defective as far as uh, uh, the quality that, uh, it, it was old and the uh, davit uh, was uh, broken at one time and they, they welded, uh, they simply welded a pipe straight down to the uh, uh, rail and it, and it was no more a davit, it, 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 it didn't have the overhang and uh, the traditional uh, method of uh, have, hanging a purse block on the davit and uh, uh, pursing in the, the bottom of the net uh, to the boat. 
uh, no longer function properly. And uh, the problem I had was that the purse block would lock into the davit and not turn with the net as, as, as you brought the leads up to the boat it needs to turn. It would want to come out of the shiv of the purse block. So I couldn't figure out how to remedy it. I took a crowbar and I would try to pry, pry the block around like that. And uh, uh, eventually what I figured out was I could undo the purse line as it was lifting the weight. I would undo it, I'd go over to the rail and I would kick the purse block loose from the pipe that it would lock into and then go and catch the line as it's sinking and wrap it back around the capstan. And uh, as I was doing that one day, and we did this all summer long, accident waiting to happen because it wasn't functioning properly, the corner of my raincoat, about one inch, just the corner, caught under the capstan. And as the line was coming in, it just kind of caught and started wrapping around the capstan, taking more raincoat until eventually it just kind of wrapped up tight and pulled me down into the uh, uh, horns on the top of the capstan and I hit my jaw and snapped my head back and uh, at that point the raincoat ripped and, and ripped free but the damage was already done. I I'd, uh, snapped my head back and broke my neck and uh, I fell back into the fish hold which was pulled back and uh, landed on a bunch of fish, thank God. We were half full of fish and uh, so that cushioned the fall when I landed, but uh, immediately upon landing in the fish hold, my leg was caught up in the line and I thought, well, I, I want to straighten out. And at that point I realized I, I couldn't move anything. I couldn't move my hands, I couldn't move my legs, and, and I was paralyzed. I was laying on these fish and uh, paralyzed down in the fish hold there. The deck winch is the most powerful thing on the boat, you know. The, it's the scariest piece of machinery that we work with, pretty much. I mean, and if you don't respect it, if you're not paying attention to what's going on, then, then uh, you definitely end up in the wrong place, for sure. So I was uh, lifting the rings, like this, and, you, and I set them down on deck, and I reached over with a pair of nylon gloves, like this, in the same type of line. And you reach over and touch it like this, and take the turns off. Well, for some reason, my arm went down, and started going, going around, and it and it built the line up over the top again and again and again, so that it had three three or four wraps over my arm. Then it started here and went all the way up to here, and then jammed me against the deck and started to pull my arm off. And this all happened in seconds. I mean, it's just it's not even minutes. It's just probably 30 or 40 seconds from the time I got tangled up. My daughter was piling the corks on the back end and she ran over and, and shut it off and then untangled me. My son that was out fishing with us it was a paramedic that worked for the fire department. So he came over and assessed my arm and, and it was, it was, there was no external bleeding or anything. So we just headed for town and called an airplane and. I climbed in the plane and climbed out, walked up and climbed in the ambulance and went into surgery for four hours, putting the arm back together. Well, it dislocated the elbow, for one thing, it smashed it, so that it was all dislocated. And then it broke, broke the bone here, and as it pulled around the winch, it uh, pulled the, the main artery out. And the nerves for these two fingers, which I can't do this anymore, the doctor said that it snapped in my neck, and they found the they found it down in here. I think I got complacent. I, th I think that I'd worked around the wench so much. Um, I would never let a rookie work on the wench. Uh, I would, and if somebody, if I saw one of my crewmates doing something bad or wrong on the wench, I would admonish him right away in front of everybody, and not let him use it for a while. Um, I thought it was a little bit ironic that I was the one who got hurt because I would ride my guys hard about that winch. I was always worried about it. I was always worried about them working with it. My arms turned numb and they started tingling like uh, uh, like if you were getting frostbite. You know, it gets real charred, uh, tingly, uh, electric kind of feeling. And, and, and my whole numb started getting, my, whole, my arms started getting numb and then started going into pain and, and uh, my fingers. And, and my fingers are still numb to these days. On, uh, and then cold, if I start getting cold, uh, 
I just go numb. So I've, I've got residual effects. I did not recover 100%, but I feel lucky is the fact that I can even walk and, uh, and, and be alive. And I just wanted to go. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to live. I wanted to recover. And uh, it was, you know, a good year before I, I got into uh, a state where, where I could actually uh, say that, yeah, I'm going to make it and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be all right, you know. But you're changed, you know. You've got, uh, you, you can't move as much as you used to and there's always that, you know, that pain in the neck. I have about 50 percent range of mobility. I had five hand surgeries to tendon transplants in my hand to give me use of my hands. Uh, I'm considered a walking quadriplegic now. I have uh, some sort of paralysis in all four limbs. That'll never go away. Uh, Eleven years after the accident, I got rid of my cane. Uh, I've, now, I'm now a safety professional. I think about this accident every morning, and I've analyzed this accident many, many times. And the one thing I can think of is that maybe I got complacent around the winch. Uh, the other thing I think about is the greed of getting that one fish. Uh, that was, that's what got me excited to reach across there. The other thing that was odd that day was that I was wearing a raincoat, and I usually didn't. The deck winch is uh, extremely powerful, extremely powerful. And that was my feeling being caught in that was completely helpless. I've never felt that helpless before. There was, I just realized there was nothing I could do, do about it while I was going around. But yeah, I am a lot more conscious of the, of the winch, and I'm, I'm conscious of my crew. It's such a slow-turning device that it just it seems so simple that you know this line is just coming in and it's moving so slowly and it eludes you that this thing could be that dangerous you know that there's that much pressure being lifted on it and uh, and you look in the crew is all of a sudden they're, they're dancing around the thing they're leaning over it like it's nothing you know and, and I just freak I, I go into it and I you know you know get <laughs> Get away, you know. No, you don't do that, you know. What was amazing was uh, when I was in the hospital, someone had a similar accident. I, I said, well, this must be a pretty rare accident, having someone get caught up in a capsin. And, uh, and uh, he said, well, no, not really. We got another guy down the hall that the same thing happened to him. Well, about every other skipper I know after this happened came and talked to me and told them their, their winch story about how they'd had a lot of close calls, how they'd been able to turn off in time. And I've probably heard over 100 stories about people being that close. I know at Harborview, they told me three to four people would come down from Alaska a year hurting a winch. Most of them don't make it. So I just feel very fortunate and I'm happy I can keep on doing what I'm doing. So yeah, safety. Safety is one big concern of mine. I, you know, I probably maybe more than other guys since I've been hurt and, and looked at it uh, in a, at a different angle, you know. and. Uh, I always thought that they should have uh, more artwork on the ceilings of hospitals. You're laying in a gurney and, and all you look at are ceiling tiles. If you don't want to be on a gurney and uh, you don't want to see anybody on a gurney, it, it's not a, a good position or not a good spot to be. It, uh, uh, emergency stop circuit has been uh, shortened to e-stop. What we believe the e-stop will do is reduce some of the danger involved around the, the capstan winch. E-stops are designed to shut down equipment quickly. E-stop was tested in uh, the 2005-2006 fisheries on the FB Lake Bay. It's a purseining vessel out of Seattle. Our goals for the East stop, the emergency stop, uh, was in the development of the, of the circuitry as well as the placement of the switch. The switch criteria uh, was important because it had to stand up to the rigors of, of, of the harsh fishing environment. Uh, it also had to be convenient and it also had to be placed in a position where it wouldn't be susceptible to false positives where the a rope would hit it or it would be it would shut down uh, when, in an inopportune time. We looked at a number of types of switches and placements for those switches but the final decision to use the type of switch and the placement of the switch was um, was verified by by the 
vessel skipper uh, Bud Maurice uh, as what would be convenient for him and other fishermen. Yeah, I, I um, really like the e-stop. We put it on last year, as you know, uh, with your guys' help, and since then, um, we just get more and more accustomed to having it, and uh, um, I really think it's a, a really nice feature. If we had an emergency stop, this accident would have, would have never happened. If, if I'd have had that emergency stop right there where I could have uh, shut it off myself, it would have never happened. So, e-stop, would you know definitely be a good investment for any saner you know if it saves one person that they don't have to go through what i did it'd be wonderful uh, i wouldn't wish what happened to me on my worst enemy uh, it's just not good and uh, bad things happen to good people victims never have a good day and that just don't want to be one it's a little hard in the winter when it's raining and blowing sideways for you know, a month at a time, <laughs> uh, but uh, you get over that. I mean, you, you, you learn to adapt and uh, it took a couple of years, you know, you kind of get, you know, like, what are we doing here, you know? <laughs> but then spring rolls around and, and then summer's coming with the fishing and by golly, that gets my heart pounding and that's what I just love doing, I love fishing. Well, <laughs> it's not for everybody, that's for sure, but uh... For those that it works for, it's wonderful. And uh, I would say that, you know, as great as the adventure and uh, the highs and lows of fishing have been, uh, that's really part of it. You know, the people have been tremendous. You know, I, I really, I've often said that Alaska's best resource is its people. And, uh, and um, I still believe that. And of course, not just Alaska, but uh, um, that's a really important part of it too, the friendships and if you're not catching fish, it's not much fun. <laughs> That's for sure. But you can live with you can live with almost anything if fishing's good.